Thank you for having me. And uh, let's see. There were supposed to be two of us uh, at this session, which uh, uh, now there's only one. Um, it may not be that uh, that bad. Um, Michele was going to tell you how terrible patents and copyright are. And you've already heard how terrible patents are. So the only difference would have been it would have included copyright. Um, and he would have given more examples of uh, the problems that the patents cause. Uh, so he would have gone into, in some detail, the, uh, the steam engine and James Watt, uh, claiming that uh, the patents allowed Watt to prevent any improvements in steam engines for a decade or two. Uh, and he would have gone through some other examples. He would have mentioned the Selden patent on the automobiles, which uh, Terence mentioned, um, and, uh, and, and a few other examples. Um, I had dinner with Terence, as you know, last night. Um, and he told me he was a big fan of, uh, of the Women's Loses in Microsoft book. Uh, and in particular, there's a paper that's the first chapter of that book, which is uh, about the QWERTY keyboard. Right. And the uh, story about the QWERTY keyboard, to keep things short, because it's not necessarily central, but the, the point is that a lot of people believe, and still believe, that the QWERTY keyboard is a terrible keyboard. And you'll come across that story over and over again. Um, Margolis and I wrote a paper in 1990 going through the evidence that had been put forward to demonstrate the disadvantage of the QWERTY keyboard as opposed to an alternative keyboard known as the Dvorak keyboard, uh, it turned out that the evidence was extremely weak. And that, if anything, the evidence was that the QWERTY was about as good as the Dvorak. Uh, and therefore, the role it was playing in the economics literature, which was the prime example of how markets choose the wrong product, uh, really wasn't relevant. It shouldn't have been an example because it really wasn't true. Uh, the thing that, of course, is interesting is uh, that was 20 years ago. Um, but if you still read the academic literature where there's less excuse, or newspapers and magazines where you don't expect them to necessarily get things right, the QWERTY keyboard story is just an, almost as strong as ever. Right? That story will not die, independent of what the actual facts are. Um, one of the contentions I wonder about, and I can't say that I, I know uh, that it's the case, the examples that uh, I just mentioned earlier that Terence had talked about and that Michele was going to talk about. It's not clear whether they're really true or not, even though it is the case that a large portion of the literature uh, has uh, argued that patents, in these particular cases in particular, have slowed down the economy and led to restrictions in technology. Um, and in particular, I'll show you a slide that gives you three papers that says that the uh, Watt steam engine was in fact not, the patent did not restrict steam engine technology at all. And everything that everyone is saying about it is basically wrong. It's, it's said in three papers and it's very convincing out there. Uh, it would have been nice to see what Michael's uh, view of that was, because he's aware of those papers uh, and responded to one of them. I'll have, I mean, I mean yeah, probably won't have time to, to give you the quote of, of the authors of those papers in, in response to uh, the Bolton and Levine uh, response. Okay, I guess there are one or two other little points I wanted to make before I get into my presentation. Um, and that is that the talk we just heard was very interesting because it was, everything was black and white. It was exciting to listen to. But I don't think that things often work out quite as black and white as that. They're, they're not as straightforward. It's not like, hey, patents are just terrible, let's just get rid of them. Which I think is a fair summary of, of, of the talk. Um, for one thing, there was very little evidence that they'd actually caused harm, and the evidence was they may not have benefited. But if they didn't benefit, then you know, if there's no evidence of an economic increase when patents were adopted in some of these countries, well, then there's no evidence of an economic decrease either. But the fact of the matter is, it's very hard to measure things like the impact of a patent on the economy because it's going to take time for it to show up. It's going to show up only in certain sectors, and empirically, it's going to be a very hard thing. To, to measure. And one other thing I, I wanted to mention, because uh, the way it's projected, it's like patent owners just want to destroy everybody else who's out there inventing and just protect their patent instead of maximizing their profits. Okay, in fact, if I own a patent and someone has a, an idea to build upon my patent, 
which would require me to give them access to my patent. And that's going to make money. I have every incentive in the world to, to, to give them my technology for a payment. That's what you expect. You don't expect to say, oh, this add-on technology that comes later, well, forget that, that's all terrible. There's big money in that add-on technology. All they have to do is buy the rights for me and I should be willing to sell it if it's really a good add-on technology. So that was completely missing in this discussion. So patent donors don't have an incentive to make the economy bad. They have an incentive to reduce their direct competitors. All right? That's what patent gives them a monopoly, but not any of the follow-ups. They have no incentive. There may be cases where, for one reason or another, the owner of a patent doesn't take good follow-on technology. So one of the things that wasn't mentioned about the, uh, the automobile patent, which my understanding is it was very weak and had very little impact on the uh, growth of the automobile, is that the owner of the Selvin automobile patent were the people that were making electric cars. Okay, the direct competitor to the internal combustion engine cars. So they would have an incentive to not allow the internal combustion engine industry to grow. But that would be very different from most others. And it was an odd coincidence that the electric car companies got to own the patent on the internal combustion engine. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the car with the internal combustion engine, which is the self patent. So that would be, even if they did have the negative impact, which is claimed, which is contrary to a lot of things I've heard, that would be an unusual circumstance that the owner of that patent wouldn't have wanted the internal combustion industry to do well and wouldn't necessarily have sold it. Now, eventually, electric cars died pretty early. And then they were trying to generate revenues from the internal combustion industry. And then Ford beat them, okay, because the patent really wouldn't hold up in court. Uh, and that was the end of the Selvin patent. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about copyright and not patent. And I believe copyright is really very different than patent um, in, in an important way. I also believe that uh, this is something I've, I've written in the last year that you can argue for copyright independent of whether or not it actually includes social welfare. Right, so economists are always talking about social welfare and maximizing sort of the efficiency of the economy, which is what we mean by social welfare. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what's the optimal copyright that maximizes the welfare of society. Um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily what we should be doing. And I'm going to argue that uh, sometimes something you can think of it as fairness, if you will, enters into it. And I think that we treat copyright owners differently than all the other workers in the economy. And I don't know that that's reasonable or fair, and there's no good explanation for that, except that we can. All right, so let me go uh, have a few simple points here. That's what I'm used to having a computer uh, to look at when I do this. Uh, all right, we all know that property rights are important for any economy that wants to be successful. That property rights are largely the reason that we got out of the uh, hunting and gathering stage. All right? So property rights are very important. Uh, and they're important because they prevent an activity known as free riding among economists, and not just economists. Okay? And free riding is when someone else does the work, but you go and generate the benefits from that work. So someone farms some land, and when the crop is ready for harvesting, you decide, let's go and take some of that crop and eat it ourselves. And the farmer, of course, loses any value he might have wanted to have from the planting of the crop because other people are eating it. And without the property rights, the chance of keeping them away, keeping people from taking the crops that he's planted, the farmer winds up losing incentive to plant the crops. Okay, And then you wind up back to gathering and hunting because nobody has any sense to cultivate. Right? So this is, this is uh, very important, and preventing free riding is very important. Um, and uh, it tends to lead to economies when you have relatively strong property rights that are more efficient. Right? Now, Terence talked about the fact that no property rights are absolute. And he's right, there are restrictions on property rights on real property. But the point is that they are pretty strong. And we usually don't make it very easy for people to violate others' property rights. 
not in a way where it will influence their incentive to use uh, or cultivate the, the crop, so to speak. Um, copyright and patents, you can view, particularly when we talk about copyrights, as it's a form of property rights. Right? They're now called intellectual property. There's a debate about whether that's even right to be calling it intellectual property, but that's the term that's, that's used. Um, if you're an author and you write a book, the question is, is should we allow you to control that book? Because copyright says you're the monopolist in the sense that only you can make copies of that book, and no one else can. And the, uh, the answer would be, I think, if all you're doing is preventing free writing, then that's fine. That's what we should want. All right? If you're preventing other competitive behavior, if you're really a monopolist, then we wouldn't want you to do that. We don't want to restrict competition. But the key thing is that by free writing, when we talk about freedom, all right, uh, and my understanding is that that's uh, you know, this party, that's an important concept. Um, and we talk about property rights, and the two are often tied together, and it's saying people who are going to be producing have the freedom to reap the rewards of what their productive activities produce. Um, it doesn't mean that consumers or potential consumers have the freedom to steal things. And uh, we have to be sure about what we mean by freedom. And so freedom to free ride is freedom that will take you back to the hunter-gatherer. All right, so from an economic efficiency point of view, you don't want it. And then from a point of view that's not just based on economic efficiency, but one sort of based on what's right. All right. I don't think you want to give people access to free ride. You can make free riding easy. And sometimes, and my claim will be, particularly with uh, Bolden and Levine, that they confuse competition and freedom with free riding. Okay? Now, because I was asked to come here, and part of it, I think, was my expertise on file sharing, I thought I would show you an example of a market where property rights have been weakened based on people who, in this case, are pirating music. Um, OK, the, uh, in general, the old-fashioned piracy on boats, uh, and I, I taught some undergraduates every once in a while. I give them a special class. Someone invites me in to talk about piracy. And two years ago, I, there was this one class that was really good. They were very, very monkeys. And about 10 people showed up dressed as pirates. OK, and they were, they were convinced that what they were doing was right. Okay, but those pirates, the real pirates, the ones who were on the boats, uh, it was bad for commerce. All right? And if, if bad enough, if piracy got strong enough on the open seas, it would get rid of international trade, except for the ones, the trade that went along land routes. Uh, co copyright piracy is really no different in those markets. Uh, and what it basically allows is the pirates free ride off of the activities of others. Now, the pirates could be companies that are making duplicates. Okay, which is what you find in a country like China to a large extent, where there are just CDs made that look just like the real CDs, but it's some other company, and none of the money goes to the actual creators of the CD. Uh, or it can be individuals who are downloading music for free, um, which technically the law says they're not, they shouldn't be doing. That the way you get access to that music is to tell the owner of that music that you want it, and you transact one way or another, and he gives you permission to, to use the music. Um, I should mention at this point, as good as any other point, we had this definition of non robberous and non excludable earlier. And for intellectual products, non robberous is the key component, the fact that it doesn't get used up. And it, that does change things from regular land, which does get used up, or pencils, or whatever the case may be. But the non, the other aspect, it's a, a fluke of economic history that the two are even combined non rivalrous versus uh, um, non-excludable. When Paul Samuelson wrote this paper, Defining Public Goods for the First Time, he was thinking of television signals. And he said, this is a very odd type of product, and it's not clear markets will handle it correctly. And he was saying, you, once the television signal is out there, you can't keep people from watching it. So it was not excludable And it was an intellectual product, so it was also non rivalrous and because he defined public goods that way, the two terms, the non-rivalrous and the non-excludable, came together. 
to do public goods, but they're completely separate. One has nothing to do with the other. And it's not the case that intellectual products are not excludable and real products are. It all depends on the law. If the law says no property on that farm, you don't own anything, then it's not, ex it's not excludable. Anybody can come and take the corn if the farm is growing corn. All right? If the law says you're not allowed to take it, then it is excludable. Same thing with copyright. If the law says anyone can take the product and that's perfectly okay, it's not excludable. But if the law says we're sticking you in jail for 20 years if we find you downloading music or we'll shoot you if we're in the US, uh, it becomes excludable. So it's not the product itself which has this non-excludable excludable characteristic. It's the laws that happen to exist. Okay? So, as a little segue, we have this issue here of piracy. Let me just show you what's happened in the, uh, in the industry. Here are the top markets ordered by the size of the uh, market. These are the countries. These are their sales and their local currencies. It says dollars, but it's really the local currency. Uh, and uh, these are the revenues in 2009. These are the 1999 revenues adjusted for inflation. And here's the percentage change. These are the top 10 countries. Every one of them has had enormous declines. The smallest decline is in Japan, which only had a 26% decline in revenue. And if you go take a look at Italy and Spain, their declines are 73 and 74%. These are enormous declines. Uh, the average is obviously in this range of 50 or so. Uh, it's very rare that you see a market where you have a sales decline of 50% in a decade, unless it's a product that clearly people aren't interested in anymore. Okay? And that's not the case. People are listening to music apparently as much as ever, as far as I can tell. Uh, certainly, uh, Apple and its iPods did very well, because it was the iPod that brought Apple back from the dead. Um, here's the US. Going back to 1973, this is the units sold. If I told you units instead of dollars or, or revenues, you would have gotten exactly the same as the stripe, basically. Napster begins in 1999-2000, uh, right here. This is a line that just says, if you continue the previous growth rate, what would it look like? This is what happened to sales in the US over the intervening years. If you take a look now, it's lower per capita in 2009 than it was in 1973. All, right, all of the gain, and this was a pretty big gain over 30 years, disappeared in the last decade. Right. Um, and so the question is, all right, that's pretty incontrovertible. These are just numbers on revenue and, and sales. How do we know it's really uh, uh, file sharing and piracy that's causing it? Um, maybe it's just something else. Uh, here's what economists, OK, ah, that's, right. that's right. Not everybody agrees that uh, that's the case. In fact, there's a very large number of people that say file sharing can't really be causing harm because they don't want it to cause harm. And it's a case where their belief of what they want overwhelms their view of the evidence. Here's what the academic studies say. Um, these are the academic studies that have found harm. Now, one of the things that no one has done until this paper that I just put on the web two weeks ago, or one week ago have done, is to say, how does the decline that they measure stack up to the decline that actually had occurred in the industry? So what percentage of the industry decline is due to file sharing according to their measurement of file sharing. Turns out it's much higher than I had realized. Um, the average number is above 100%. Right? The majority of studies say the entire decline that's occurred, that was the first chart I showed you with the 50% decline on average, is due to file sharing. Now you may say, how can some of these be more than 100%? This is a bunch that are more. And the answer is, if it's more than 100%, it just means that the econometric study predicted that there would have been an increase in sales except for file share. Right? And that would be a number more than 100% of the decline. Um, the lowest number here is 20 to 40%. The few that are under 100 are still 75 and 65 and 45. They're all big numbers. Okay? And so the industry, and these are all the studies that have been published in the academic literature. Uh, there are two others that don't find this conclusion. Uh, that I've looked at very carefully. Uh, there are two studies that don't find harm. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in, on them, but there are very serious problems with those studies. Okay? Um, in 
one case, the less serious of the two, there were two results in the study. One result was that it caused harm. The other one says it didn't cause harm. It actually benefited sales. This is in Canada. Uh, they went with the benefit sales. And the only problem was if you believe that result, it means that if, there, if it wouldn't have been for file sharing, there would have been zero albums sold in the country. That the only reason they were selling any albums was because of the beneficial impact of file sharing, which is such a preposterous notion that it clearly is wrong. And to get that, they had to throw out all the non-file shares. All right, so what they basically said is we have a universe of users. Some share files and some don't. When we include them all together, they get a negative impact of file sharing, which is the same size as the positive, but the opposite sign. And they said, but if we throw out the non-users, so we only have the people that engage, and we take a look at the ones that do more file sharing and less, they get the results saying it's positive. Well, that's like saying, let's take a look at the impact of cigarette smoking, but throw out all the non-smokers. All right? Clearly, there's less information if you do that. And so it's, what they did makes no sense. The other paper, uh, which was published in a much better journal and had much better impact, is just, to be honest, a pack of lies. Okay? And just something that you can't really believe. Uh, all right. So the question is, there's no doubt that we have this big decline in file sharing. The, uh, and, I'm sorry, in record sales. And it appears to be due to file sharing in its totality. Is that a problem? And that gets to this issue of, do we want to protect copyright? Because that's what's going on in the case of file sharing. It's a weakening of copyright, in the sense that other people are making copies without the permission of the copyright holder. Um, first of all, copyright is not much, if any, of a monopoly. One of the things that Boldrin and Levine do is they talk about this monopoly, and intellectual property monopoly. And there is an element of monopoly in patents. That is clear. But there's really no element of monopoly in copyright. Uh, and the way I, I want to try to make this argument is that uh, copyright is very narrow, or it's supposed to be very narrow. And so if you write exactly the same story that I write, you can copy it and sell it. Right? As long as you can show that you did not see my story when you wrote it. Copyright does not say nobody else can have to make a copy. They can't copy yours. But they can create one that's exactly the same as yours. But of course, they're not going to. You know, there's a story that if you put enough monkeys in a room for enough period of time, that they will wind up with a William Shakespeare play. Okay? Well, that's like in physics, you learn that all the air in this room could move to the other side. Okay? And if I remember correctly, it's 1 over one, 10 to the 10 to the 27. Something like that are the odds of that happening. Right? It's not going to happen. And the, and the monkeys are not going to wind up to Shakespeare. And no one is going to wind up writing exactly the same story as yours if your story is of any length. All right? So copyright is really just the protection of expression. And it's very individual. Whoever wrote the piece that uh, we're talking about that's getting copyright, nothing else like it will be created unless it's copied. All right, so yes, it's a monopoly on the ability to make copies. All right? But that does not restrict competition in any way. What competition is about, remember, it's not preventing, you know, freedom doesn't mean that you have the freedom to be able to take things and steal things from other people. In this case, competition is writing another story similar to the first one, where you're trying to take their market away because they're doing very well. So Danish mystery stories become big. So all people in Denmark start writing mystery stories, all right, to try to cash in. That's competition. The taking someone who's actually written the work and making a copy of it, that's not competition. That's just stealing. And so the way the cop way competition works here is to produce a different product that may be very similar, but it's not a violation of copyright because you created it yourself. Do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. If I write a book and I call it Harry Potter and the Truman House, is that legal or is that not legal? Because well, Harry Potter is, 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 a, is a term, and we're not talking about copyright. We're talking about trademark. Okay. And, and it becomes more complicated. And so you, you violated the trademark if, you, if you're using it without their permission. And there are, life is not black and white. And there are always going to be some gray edges where it's not the straightforward as I'm putting it. And someone produces something and they say it's original and you say it's not. And you can fight about it. Um, there, in fact, was a case where somebody did create a Harry Potter book of spells or whatever it was. The problem with that book, which wound up going to court, and the, the Potter people won. And actually, they called me up, the lawyers from the other side, Larry Lessig, 
to see if I would be willing to testify for them. I said, is there anything they've written in here that's original? They said, all the wording is directly from Harry Potter book. <coughs> but they did all the work of finding it and putting in the words. Okay, but they didn't describe the spell with their own words. It was the spell as described in the original. So every word was the word taken from the Harry Potter book. I thought it should lose, and it did lose. But, you know, there can be questions. But in, in general, you know, you write a book and it's different. You wrote it from scratch. You're not going to be violating mine. All right? If you start using the characters, there was a, a well-known law professor I'd like to talk about. The book called The Wind On, Wind On Gone, gee, you know, you know the, the famous book uh, was Gone With The Wind. And then there was a, a, a secondary book written many years later from the point of view of the slaves. And it was sued by the estate of the uh, Gone With The Wind. And the question was, was it a violation of copyright? Now, in fact, it was found not to be a violation of copyright. But if you want to write a book and not worry about it, don't use exactly the same characters, because it had all the characters. It had Red Butler and all the other characters from Gone with the Wind. Just give them different names. I mean, if you want to use other people's names and other people's descriptions, you're asking for trouble. You don't have to do that. You're actually free writing of it. She knew her book probably wouldn't sell that well if it had its own characters. It was going to sell a lot better if it appeared to have something to do with the Gone with the Wind character. So she was using that to help her sales. Mm. All right. And, and it was found not to be a copyright violation. All right. So again, competition is not making copies of someone else's work. That's free writing. Free writing is bad. Um, the way you compete is to produce similar works, not the same one. Yeah. That's if they're given permission to do so. A lot of the people who are involved in that think it's good publicity, and they tell their friends, go ahead, you can, you can write these things. But you know, the copyright owner is the one who gets to decide under the current law. And they can decide it's good for them, or they can decide it's not. They can decide, I mean, she could have, you can always go to the copyright owner and say, give me the rights. Right? And the rights will cost some money. Um, and maybe you'll reach an agreement, and maybe you won't. If it's Shakespeare, he's out of copyright, so he can do anything you want. Uh, okay. Now, the term monopoly, I think, is being used carelessly in this literature by people who are critics of intellectual property, because they're basically saying, if you have a monopoly on the ability to make a copy, that's a monopoly. But it's not really a monopoly. Because one of the things you have to realize, we all have monopolies. We have a monopoly on ourselves. Okay? It's not worth much for most people. All right? But we all have, you're the only person who can say you are you and you have your particular talents and you go out on that market. You know, go ahead, use that monopoly, see if you can create dead weight losses, have fun. It's not going to happen for most people. Um, you have a monopoly on your house. You have a monopoly on your car. Now, once your car is off a lot, even when it's on, they're not exactly the same anymore. There's no car that's exactly the same as yours that has the exact same junk sitting in the back seat. Okay? Does that give you an advantage in the market of any sort? And the answer is no. Because there's lots of other cars that are very similar out there, and you have to compete with them if you're trying to sell yours. Um, those monopolies are worthless monopolies. They're not really monopolies. We don't talk about people having monopolies on themselves. Um, but they all technically have monopoly. Every property right actually gives you a monopoly on whatever it is that that property right is on. They're just not meaningful in any economic sense. Right? And so when people are using terms in intellectual property, say they're monopolies, most of them aren't monopolies. They're not monopolies at all. They don't restrict competition, and they don't provide any value. Um, okay. And so you can use the term, but it's not a very meaningful term. You know? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. All right. So here's sort of we're getting into uh, the meat of, uh, of, of this argument, which starts leaving economics and becomes one of you know, touchy-feely, right and wrong. Um, right, some people have a monopoly on themselves that is worthwhile. If you're a great athlete, your monopoly is on your athletic ability. Not very many other people have that athletic ability. You get paid big money in basketball or football or whatever. And by that, of course, I mean soccer, since we're here in Europe. Uh, that is something that you have that's unusual. The 
Same thing can be true of doctors and architects and even professors. There are some very highly paid professors in the world because they're really good at what they do. Right? And that extra money is known as economic rent. And all the textbooks will tell you, well, you could, you could tax economic rent and not cause any harm to economic well-being. Because people, the definition of rent is they still don't change their behavior even if you take it away. Um, the thing is, we don't go around taking away economic rent from people when they have particularly good talents. We don't sort of say, we have taxes, but we don't go around trying to measure how much rent. We don't say, gee, this particular basketball player could have been a brain surgeon could have made a million dollars a year as a brain surgeon, he's now making two million dollars playing basketball, so there's only a million dollars for him. Whereas this other basketball player will be a shoe shine guy, making a thousand dollars a year, except he's getting two million now, so all of his is rent. We don't go making those distinctions, we don't try to reduce rent, even though it might improve economic efficiency if we did. And the reason I think we don't is it would just seem wrong. All right? We don't want to live in a society where we're just not letting people benefit from their talent. Right? Copyright is required, or at least it's useful, for people with unusual talent who happen to be writers or musicians <coughs> to be able to generate the revenues that their works are capable of generating. All right? Now, it is true that even if copyright didn't exist, you can get some of that money in different ways. All right, the cover is the most direct way to just say, you created that song, you should be able to get paid for it. You created that book, if people want to read it, they should be paying you, not somebody else. And so copyright is just a mechanism that allows their natural monopoly power, in their terms of their talent, to, to come through in the marketplace. Copyright doesn't provide monopoly, it just allows the monopoly in talent to come through. Most people who write books never get enough back on sales to cover the advance if those in advance. Most people who make records never sell enough to cover the advance. They're what are known as dry wells. You hit a few big winners and those make lots of money and most of the books and most of the albums are flops and they're not making any money and there's no monopoly power in inherent in it. Um, the few who are the better ones, the big names, the superstars, they're the ones who get the monopoly power. And one of the reasons I think that uh, there's such dislike and, and hatred, actually, in the academic community towards the uh, copyright is they hate the fact that there are superstars. They just hate those superstars. First, because they say they're no good. The people who make the albums that the academic community like often are not the most successful. Okay, and number two, they don't want anyone to make that type of money and have such adulation and act so badly as they uh, for whatever reason, they really dislike it. Uh, but it's just that's how they get their money. It's no different than a football player. All right. So the question is, why are copyright creators not allowed? Because if we say, let's make copyright 10 years instead of life plus 70 years, like that, we're restricting their ability to generate <laughs> revenue. If we, make, if we move copyright altogether, we'd be restricting it even more. Why does that seem like it's something we should do? Why should we try to figure out what's economically efficient? We don't figure out in the case, for, for example, let's say the football players, let's say basketball players, so we all know what sport we're actually talking about. All right? No basketball player is allowed to make more than $100,000 because none of them have an opportunity to cost greater than that. That would lower the cost of running the football team, I'm sorry, the basketball team. That could then lower the price that people char that gets charged at CBA. That would increase consumption and it would be a net plus for society would increase economic efficiency. Even if it would, most people would say, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to live in an economy, at least a lot of people would. At least a lot of people out of academia would say that. Um, the question is, why are we willing to do that? And maybe it's only because it's only in the academic community that these discussions occur. But <laughs> academics are perfectly willing to do that for copyright only. Okay? I just don't think there's any explanation for why you want to restrict the rents that people get on their talent in copyright industries that what they get in these other industries. Now, the reason I think that they do it is because copyright allows them to do it very easily. And the reason for that is we all take, certainly we're in old East Germany, so maybe I need to be careful about what we all know and what we all don't know. But in general, and I think the people in this room, presumably going to this party, understand private property is a very useful concept. 
Okay, and, and we take that as something that's natural rights. Okay, um, even with its restrictions. But copyright's newer than that. Copyright hasn't been around as long as land. Copyright only has come into existence in a serious way since people can make lots of copies. First of all, you couldn't make copies at all in any reasonable way until the printing press came along. And then you couldn't make copies of most of these type of products we're talking about in any serious way until the last few hundred years. So in terms of rights, in terms of uh, uh, what we think of as, as fundamental rights, this has been around a much shorter period of time. So whereas we expect, I expect, the government to make private property rights a fundamental aspect of the Constitution, so to speak, we're talking about something the Constitution, we treat copyright as, well, and in the US Constitution it says, it's there to maximize efficiency. Um, it doesn't say these other rights, other private property is there to maximize efficiency. It's there because you have that right. I don't think there's any reason to treat copyright any differently than ownership over yourself. Um, even if it weren't socially enhancing for welfare. Right? Now there's a debate about whether or not what the optimal copyright left is for uh, maximum social benefit. Right? And we don't know the answer. It could be very long, it could be much shorter than the current. But regardless of what it is, we don't look to other markets <coughs> to reduce the rights of individuals to earn their income in a way that maximizes social welfare. Okay? And I don't know any reason we should treat it differently here. Okay, um, so I'm calling it mistreating creators. Why treat them differently and inferior to other people when they earn their revenues? whether it's high or low. Um, and, you know, I think this is just, this is my, this is what I just went through. I should have shown you the slide. Okay. Um, and I think it's just because they can. Because copyright is there as something that can be changed. Uh, now, <coughs> eminent domain also changes. Lots of other things change. Okay, that eminent domain law is not going to last long in the U.S. You'll see. They're gonna, they're, they'll overturn that. Um, okay. So that basically is my story here, is that... Uh, if you think about it in terms of the people who create these things, it's their creation, their individuals. Individuals are allowed to earn whatever they can, and copyright's just the, the technique that allows them to earn their money, and any monopoly they have is in their talent, not from the copyright. All right, I have this more fully explained in this article that's coming out, even though the date is last month. Uh, should be sometime. It's on my web site somewhere. Um, and then patents are different. Okay, not as terrible, I'm sure, as what we've just heard, and not as double terrible as if Michaeli would have been here to just repeat how unbelievably horrible patents are. Uh, but there are differences, which is <coughs> copyright doesn't restrict real competition, it just restricts this free riding. Patent does restrict real competition. All right? Because if you independently work on exactly the same product as someone else, and they get the patent a week before you, you're not copying theirs, you've created it yourself. Now, one of the things I do agree with, and I know it's in McKaylee's book, and maybe Terrence has an opinion, a change to copyright law that says, if you can show that you independently worked on it and didn't copy, maybe a hard thing to show, that copyright law should allow you, I'm sorry, patent law should allow you to, to have your good and, and, and you're not controlled by the prior patent. I would agree with that. Um, and the broadness, of a patent is a difficult issue. Parents brought this up. It is a difficult issue. And non-obvious is difficult. I mean, when I take a look at some of these business patents, you know, the one-click thing, I said, geez, that is so obvious. How could you patent that? That's ridiculous. Clearly, the system makes mistakes. But again, you can try to fix the mistakes. The question is, do you want to throw out the whole baby with the bathwater? Or is, do we know enough about patents to say we really want to get rid of it? Terrence says yes. I haven't investigated, but I would be, think it's a lot closer call than, uh, than he's telling us. Um, okay, so clearly the case for patents is more difficult. Um, but, and, and Terrence told us there is no secrecy. Terrence told us a few other things, too, that were sort of a little too black and white. He said no company that ever is going to be successful engages in secrecy. They just let everything out. Well, my answer to that is Apple. All right, the at the moment, most successful company in the world, market, company with the highest market capitalization, no one is more secretive than Apple is. Nobody's allowed to say what the new products are, 
You get your head cut off if you work for the company and you let any of this information out. You sue people who reveal things about it, who go outside. This is not a company that's freely exchanging information with everyone, okay? which is why they're suing Samsung as well. Uh, they've done just fine. So it's not, it's not as black and white. Maybe in general companies that engage in information do do better, but clearly not. The statement, I think, was they never do well. All right? Someday Apple will do badly, but their secrecy didn't seem to be pretty bad. Also, I don't know if it made it into the Wall Street Journal edition in Europe. It did in the US a week ago. They were in the story about the bullet train in China that went off the road, uh, off the tracks. Uh, and Siemens said that they had provided a piece of uh, equipment to them, and they were afraid, like the crane that we heard about earlier, that the Chinese were going to reverse engineer this piece of equipment and learn how it operated. So they stuck it in in such a way that uh, it, you couldn't take out the chip, and you couldn't really reverse engineer it. And so what they said, the Chinese never w could figure out if they you know, weren't able to reverse engineer exactly how that worked. They told them how it worked, but they didn't give them the same information they gave to other Western countries. And they said that may have been, it's only speculation, one of the reasons why the train went off the track. Okay? If you don't have patents where you're comfortable, or property rights, where you're comfortable that it, they'll be respected, the alternative is secrecy. And I'm sure that's not the only example of secrecy, just the one that from last week. And I had I wrote this chart before I knew that Terence was going to say that no one ever engages in secrecy. But I'm sure they do. And it can lead to problems. And so the real alternative to patents is everyone trying to keep things secret to some extent. Right, so I think it's a little more complicated. Uh, I don't know the answer. I'm not saying patents are good. But what is not different about patents is that you still don't want to encourage free writing. All right, if someone came up with the idea and someone else is just going to take it, you don't want to allow people to just take it, because you do want the people to come up with the ideas, to get some reward for it. I, I don't think that those ideas are... Most of them are a dime a dozen. I agree. Just like most copyrighted works are worth nothing. But there are a few important ones, and sometimes they're expensive, and what, from what I read in these other histories, ran out of money several times, and Bolton was just one of his financiers, the last one. Um, <coughs> They, we may never have gotten a steam engine <coughs> if they weren't willing to put big money in. It took them 10 or 15 years to bring it to market. Because they knew, they expected to get a patent and they expected to get money from that. Not clear that they would have thought just being first in the market would have been sufficient. Maybe it would have, but they've, in their writings they keep saying how the patent is what they're interested in and without the patent they wouldn't give the money. Okay, so I think that pretty much uh, ends it. All right. uh, I did have, yeah, these are the, you want to read the anti Baldwin articles that say that the steam engine <coughs> did not have any problems due to patents. These are the three articles. They're very convincing. And Baldwin and Levine give you an overview. They're not going into original documents. These guys are going into original documents in horrible detail. All right. So they spend a lot of time on it. Um, and here's what they say about Baldwin and Levine. I thought he was going to give him his talk. He's sort of mean to have done it anyway. It's even meaner to do it now. But they claim that uh, even after Baldwin and Levine saw their counter arguments, that Baldwin and Levine said that they made the changes, but they said the changes were not sufficient. <coughs> that they're still pushing this argument that doesn't meet the facts. Uh, and one of the arguments Baldwin and Levine was going to make is that after the patent expired in 1800, it just took off. Well, this is, these are the numbers. The growth rate, in percentage terms, didn't change at all. It was just growing at a relatively constant rate the whole time. There was a much bigger jump, if you want, after 1830. Now, the truth is, these numbers are all so close to zero. I should magnify the scale. Well, they should magnify the scale. But they, you know, the claim they want to make is this is where the, the steam engine, the watt, expired, the uh, patent. And after that, things just went nuts. It's not clear that this, that's really true. This is, again, that's from the article, uh, those three articles that I, I, I mentioned. So I figured that all those would come up. All right, so this is what would have come up. These two, I'm pretty sure, are nonsense now. Uh, oh, verdict. Yeah, they mentioned the one copyright example that Bolton will be had is that after Bernie got control of his copyrights, he apparently didn't have them for a long time. He's, he didn't write any more opera, I guess. Um, I'm not sure why that's a terrible thing. 
I mean, you want to live and take it easy? We're going to, you know, if economic efficiency said we'll get the biggest GDP by enslaving <laughs> some of our people, would we say, oh yeah, okay, let's enslave them because that's going to increase the GN GDP. You know, we have a relatively easy time. It seems like freedom and property rights also gives you the biggest GDP. So you don't have to choose between efficiency and what may seem to be the right thing to do. Right? But if you have to choose, it's not clear you want to choose the economic efficiency. And I saw Milton Friedman once ask, because he's out there you know, saying, oh, look, Hong Kong has all this freedom and look how their economy has grown. And his argument was free markets lead to a high standard of living and it was efficient in those. And someone said, well, what if it wasn't? What if, in fact, it didn't lead to high standards of living? And Friedman said, I'd be in favor of freedom then and free markets even if it didn't. It's not the economic efficiency that counts, it's the freedom that counts. Okay? And I think that that statement is basically right. Okay? And that's sort of the argument that I'm putting to copyright. <coughs> even if it's not efficient, and it's no evidence that it's not efficient, we still want to allow it to exist with very few restrictions. Okay, because that's just the way these people own this work that's due to their time. Okay, I think I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Sunday. Um, so I open the discussion and uh, it's the first word. Yeah, I, I just want to say is that there is no conflict between us. Um, um, and if there is, I know, you love Winners and Losers of Microsoft. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, take the Watt story, and you're absolutely right. The James Watt story is very simple. Um, just to expand, James Watt invented the steam engine, he had this monopoly, uh, which was given to him by Parliament for 26 years, and everyone was using the old and new common engines uh, because they were outside the monopoly. And then when the monopoly died, a, a Cornishman called Trevidic, he never pronounced his name, invented high pressure steam engines, he was finally allowed to do it because. Uh, the patent has expired, and the high-pressure steam engine. Is okay, can I stop you for one second? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> one one of these articles called is called high-pressure steam, and it claims that the the Watt patent had no restriction whatsoever right. on high-pressure steam. Right. But my point is, if it turns out that example is false, it wasn't my example. I go, <laughs> I'm very happy to be told the facts are wrong. And one of the things that Stan and I were talking about last night is these economists who, when they're disproved, then try to ignore the disproof. That's nonsense. Of course, if the facts are wrong, then the facts are wrong, and you change your story. Uh, and where you pick up value judgments, of course, one can't dispute them here. Do you have an immortal right to And actually, your distinction between freedom and freedom, I completely agree. And of course, the reason I presented my story about patents as black and white is that everyone assumes patents are a good thing. And I was trying to jolt people. Not in the world I come from. No, no, but you don't have the world. You're an economist. And you people, economists, professional economists, are sequestering universities to leave ordinary people to lead their lives you know, with comparative freedom and peace. But, um, so I was trying to put a very strong case against Pratt, for heaven's sake, if the evidence ultimately disproves it, of course I would go right. Having said all that, the experiment of Switzerland and the Netherlands, <coughs> I agree with Pratt, but certainly it's very hard to show convincingly that Pratt are a good thing. Better than, and, and that's all. And you and I are not disagreeing because we're both rational men. I completely agree. <laughs> Can I take my question? Uh, um, what about uh, you using part of music, for instance, to, to uh, do samples? And uh, um, then I read a book from uh, James Boyer uh, about the case of um, Ray Charles. Uh, uh, Ray Charles song was or, uh, uh, it was used uh, in, a, in a sample in. in 2005, uh, around the time uh, of the Katrina uh, um, um, earthquake, uh, 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 hurricane, uh, hurricane. hurricane, and um, and they uh, sued them uh, to use uh, part of a song in a, in a new song, and the, the problem was uh, that the, uh, the the history of, of, of music builds on. On different songs and different tunes, and, and where would you uh, 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 have a, a border or put a border? On? That's where you get into these gray areas where things are not that simple. Now, the fact is, when you <coughs> take someone else's song and make it part of yours, you know you can argue whether it's fair use or not. And in copyright, there is this alternative where 
if you engage in a use that's considered fair, then you don't have to pay. Right? You don't need the copyright owner's permission, but you often don't know if it's fair until you've gone to court. Um, but, and that's to allow people to write articles, academic type articles, scholarly articles, reviews, where they're quoting little bits of pieces of other people's work to sort of make their point. Uh, in the case of music, there's a, there was a, uh, and I'm sure it's still going on, there's a, there was a relatively new style of music, which was we're going to take other people's music and we're going to play it backwards and change the speed and whatnot, and we're going to put it all together and say it's a new song. But you're using someone else's music. The way you normally go about that, because these were commercial releases to a large extent, is you, you get permission. And if the owner of that particular song doesn't want to give you permission, let's say it's the Beatles, who never give you permission. Um, then you either figure out a way to use someone else's song, or you don't use it. I mean, yes, I'm sure that there's this creativity involved here, but is it really the case that you can't create your song, which is a uh, mix-up or mash-up of other songs, without using that particular one? I mean, again, it, there is an element of free driving. If a listener recognizes it, and the person will create some publicity when you do this as well, you're getting some gain from other people's work, and it makes sense that you should be forced to pay them for the right to do that because they're the ones who are helping you make your song successful. Otherwise, go write your own song. Um, it's not that hard to do. Uh, the fact is that you know most there are certain you know, and I don't want to get out of my field of expertise. But in music, there's you know people learn from others about you know chords and the way things work and the way the structure of songs. That's not copyrighted though. Right? Uh, it's only if you have a song that's exactly the same as someone else's. And there'll be a debate sometimes. So, I mean, there was this George Harrison spe special that's out now. And he was sued, according to the special, I haven't remembered this, for My Sweet Lord being the same as some other song. Well, the thing about songs is unlike books and all those monkeys, you can get the same song with those monkeys sitting in the room for a while, because songs aren't very long, and they're not they're that complicated in terms of how many notes there are. Um, and so there was another song that sounded very like, much like the words of Christmas completely different, but a very similar tune. And the way those work is if you can show that you could never have heard it, then it's allowed. But if there's a chance you would have heard it, and the argument looks like it's a pretty well-known song, you should have known it, even if it's 10 years old. So I, th I think he lost, and I think he had, had to pay something. Uh, but that's a case where you don't know. He may have actually, in his mind, remembered that tune. It sounded good. He couldn't remember that it came from anywhere else. Uh, but those, again, those are few cases. There are not very many of those cases. All right? And so it's not like uh, the world is flooded with copyright infringement cases. There aren't that many. And they're not that costly. Uh, the few that are out there are the ones that you always read about. If you read literature that I read, there must be a hundred articles talking about the wind and gun and how terrible it was that they, had, they were sued by the state of. Uh, of, uh, of gum and gum. Even though they won. Because there are so few other good examples. Um, what is your personal opinion about Google Books? About Google Books? Oh, Google Books. Yes. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you, I got called, um, I know the chief economist for Google. And uh, I was sitting in academic conference next to him in a bus, which was taking us somewhere. And we started talking about the Google Books, and I said, well, the argument for economic efficiency sort of depends on who can, what's the cost of opting out versus the cost of opting in. You can make a case that it's if socially efficient, forget this other stuff that I was talking about, pure social efficiency, for Google to be allowed to tell people that they have to opt out if it's too hard to get in touch with all these other book owners out there. I said, but the key is really how easy they make it to opt out. And the next thing you know, I'm getting a call from Google's lawyer. He wants to know if I'd be willing to testify about that. He said, well, I'd love to testify. I get paid lots of money, because you get lots of money when you testify about these things. Um, but I said, look, you'd have to show me, convince me, that you're making it as easy as possible for people to opt out. Because if you're lowering <coughs> those costs, then I think you have a reasonable case. He says, the lawyer says, well, what do you mean by making it easy to opt out? I said, well, uh, a company that's out there publishing thousands of books just gives you a list of a thousand ISBNs, and that's it. They don't have to fill out like a page with lots of stuff on it for every single book. You're making it easy. So I'll get back to you on that. I never heard that. <laughs> so I believe, because Google does, this is their modus operandi, they want a world where you have to opt out. 
the world of copyright is usually work. You get, you get permission first, then you create whatever you create. Mm -hmm. Google's world is, no, we use it. Yeah. And then if you don't like it, we'll discuss it. Okay, and we'll let you out. All right? But they do that in a way that's not completely nice. All right, so I was at a conference on Google not too long ago. Um, they still want, they wanted me on their side, but it's hard to be. I, I wasn't testifying for, I was going to testify, I never actually testified for it. You're being sued by, YouTube's being sued. I wish I could remember who the client was. Um, but uh, at any rate, it was one of these uh, movie companies. The uh, Google does not want to make it easy. They, th what they did most recently, which they've now rescinded, they voluntarily, under pressure, they would have you go to a website, it was very useful, and you'd look up a restaurant or something like that on Google. And all of a sudden, the reviews from TripAdvisor or the reviews of some other site would come up telling you about the restaurant. Well, as a user, this is great. But TripAdvisor's whole business is the reviews. And Yelp's whole business is the reviews. And so I asked the guy from Google, who's giving a presentation, are you paying TripAdvisor and Yelp for putting up their stuff, which the opt-in? He said, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we allow them to, it, we have these search bots that go finding all this information. They can put code on the page, which will make it so that we don't have that information because we don't search that page. But that means that if someone wants to use Google to find out reviews, they'll never be sent to TripAdvisor or Yelp. So if you don't let us use your stuff for free, we're going to make so anybody using our search engine never finds you. Okay, so it's not exactly, oh, it's easy to can out that and don't cost it themselves. Okay, so that's, that's the type of thing that got, got them in trouble recently. Okay, but they're not doing that anymore. But I, I don't like their opt-out. And, and the DMCA, the Digital Millennium <coughs> Copyright Act in the U.S., which um, people talked about being draconian when it came out. Um, it has a uh, safe harbor provision, which means and this is one of the things that uh, the fostering services, uh, some of them take advantage of. If you find that uh, a company is out there making your work available without permission, uh, you have to tell them about it, and they have to then take it down. But as long as they take it down shortly after you ask, they're within the law. Well, the way YouTube worked is they had millions and millions of people uploading the same video. And the, the movie companies, would find works, television companies, and ask to get taken down. But as long as it takes 24 hours or 48 hours to come down, it never get disappears because users are sticking it up there faster than the companies can ask to have it taken down. Google could have proactively, and it did wind up doing this again under pressure from a lawsuit, just put a filter in. It was easy to find most of that stuff and not allow it to go up. But they didn't do that until the lawsuits Viacom. Viacom was the company that, uh, that hired me almost testified for that. Um, they could have done it, but they waited until the lawsuit basically got going before they made it available. You can understand that. You can understand they're within the law. But I was very disappointed from a company that wants to do, what is it, do no harm? What's it? Be, don't be evil? Yeah, because that was really skirting things, I thought. So that's sort of what I think. Last question? What's your okay. current services? You made a clear statement about copyright and rewarding the talent that's used to, to produce something. Um, we are coming from a, from a physical world. I bought a book. I got the right to, to read the book. Now we are transferring to a digital world. Um, I still own the book. Do I have the right to have an electronic copy of the book or obtain it from anywhere? So this is kind of the shift I should suppose that's currently challenging us most. Well, it's, it doesn't have to be. If you say that uh, the government just basically stays out of this and the rules are that the seller gets to choose, mm -hmm. the seller would be willing presumably to sell two versions of the book, one where you get one and it's a lower price, and one where you get automatic backup forever you know, on their server somewhere and then maybe a slightly higher price. And you can decide as a user whether or not that extra feature is valuable to you and there's no reason why there should be any objection to that as far as I can see. 
I don't see why we need the government saying there have to be two available or not. All right, it's, it's something that seems to be perfectly capable of being worked out in the market. No, I'm, I'm coming from a different direction. It's about um, the, the copyright laws currently. So I understand the point to say um, there's talent out there that creates some kind of fiction or music or whatever it is and has the right to sell it. So I'm the, the buyer of it, of the right to, to listen to it, to read it, to view it. To destroy whatever I want to do, to, to not recognize it. So I have a physical copy. I, the, so I have to assume that the author got paid for the book, for the idea he put into it. Right, when you bought the book, the original when physical I, copy. The book. Yes. So I can take out this book whenever I want out of my bookshelf. Right. And you so, can you can lend it to people. I can lend. And you know, there's this whole question of libraries. Okay, I, I don't yeah. want to want to. Do, so I want to go into that. I suppose that's a totally, again, complete different realm. But so I, I'm not just talking about myself. I want to take the right. What's your point of view on? Am I entitled to obtain an electronic copy without further asking a permission to obtain it? No, not if it's not part of the agreement. If people want that, that will be made available and there'll be a price extra for that. And you can decide whether or not you want that extra feature. But, but the, 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 the idea... Well, but look, if you bought, if you bought a CD yeah. and uh, your kid covered it with peanut butter and wouldn't play anymore, that doesn't necessarily entitle you to a new CD. Maybe the manufacturer of the CD says, send me the old one, and we'll send you a new one, because they're nice. <laughs> and maybe yeah, they but say, but tough. But the problem is that they have to produce it. It's kind of the, to, to, to make the copy. So I'm not... Oh, it's, it's certainly a, a lower cost, presumably, to do it. But it's not completely zero, and they have to go through the transaction of, of letting you do it. I mean, the, the nicer thing, it's actually, things are better. They're more precise in the digital world, because... The black and white, the gray areas that existed before, we can, part of it was we had to come up with a rule because the transactions cost of, of controlling every little use would be too high. Now we could, in theory, control the usage and pay for it, and that's all that we should let the market decide what the rights are. I mean, when they used to have people complaining because if you, back when the music on iTunes was set to only work on five different computers, all right, it had this copy protection. People hated copy protection. Okay, well, it, it was five computers, and they could have said, well, here's one that you can use on any number, and it's more money. Okay, and that's what you would have wanted the market to do. Unfortunately, the market didn't seem to have enough variety at that point to allow that. Okay, but in principle, something like that could come along. And once that's something that's capable of having happen, that's what you should want to see. Lots of variations in contracts between the buyer and the seller in terms of exactly what they can and can't do. As long as it's reasonably clear. Now, that in theory, that's simple to say that's the way it works. And the reality is, life is much tougher than that, and, and, and it may not be that simple. But aren't you protecting the distributors than the authors and the, the creators of it with this approach? Well, the distributors, the, there's no cost virtually in the electronic distri distribution. So I don't know that you're really protecting anyone. Uh, the way the, you'd expect things to evolve is if people are spending different amounts, more, more money for the one that gives them a backup copy than less, the actual creator is getting more as well because he gets a percentage of the sales. So if the sales are higher, the dollars are higher, the euros are higher, the creator gets more. And the way things often work is when there's some market that wasn't seen, a lot of times it doesn't work this way either, uh, the percentage the author gets is much higher when it gets used in a market that wasn't initially envisioned. That's not always true, but in the case of records, when they would have uh, record clubs, and record clubs would do their own production, um, the split between the author and the original record company would be 50-50, as opposed to having the author get 10%, which would be more like 15%, a more standard record contract. Okay, now there are cases where new rights come along, and it's true for reporters in the U.S., people who are writing, um, people who are writing for magazines, and they, the, a lot of those companies were saying, you don't have any rights in the electronic world. Right? Um, that was not foreseen. Um, stuff that tends to be foreseen, but a separate market. We know it's there, but we don't know if you're going to get any of it. The split's usually better, and the author usually gets a piece of it. 
And that's what you'd expect. Now they try to make the contracts written in such a way that any market that could possibly arise in this solar system or any other, you know, we get a piece of. <laughs> yeah, just a quick question because I like your example with the book Gone with the Wind. Um, I mean, if it was um, a true story, a true historic event with, with uh, historic persons, like you could write a book from the perspective of another person, and it would be perfectly okay because the things happen. But just because it is fictional and it became. I'm, so not, I'm not sure that's entirely true. If you wrote a story about a current living person where they're playing a role and you'd make them a child molester. I'm not sure that you're going to have such an easy time publishing that book. Okay? But that's not a copyright issue. That that's, <laughs> goes outside. Um, you're certainly allowed to use historical characters. Nobody really owns those. But people will write books using old characters from old books. All right? And that's, you know. Um, so there was one Sherlock Holmes, older brother or something like that, that which are it's not Sherlock Holmes, it's not any of that uh, Conan Doyle stuff, but it's using Conan Doyle people in there. Well, if it's out of copyright, then you can do whatever you want. If it's still under copyright, then it's not clear you, because again, you're appropriating people see Sherlock Holmes, and they maybe want to buy it because they're Sherlock Holmes fans. You're getting value from what Conan Doyle did. It's not clear you should be able to do that without his permission. What about fair use? Uh, am I not allowed to write a parody about Harry Potter or Mickey Mouse, for example, and then I have to call it Harry Potter or Mickey Mouse? Well, you can do a parody without exactly the same names. People will normally know what you're talking about. But parody is one of the exceptions that's allowed in general in fairness, and that's sort of how the Wind on Gone basically got through. Uh, so you, you can probably do that. Um, but you want to speak to a lawyer, if you're going to draw the attention, it would be better to get the permission. Mm -hmm. Remember, mm -hmm. the people who have this don't necessarily all say, we never want anyone to use this. Because you're going to pay the money if you get their permission. They will want to give you permission if they think it's not going to hurt them and it's going to give them some money. That should be what we think of as the first route. And that's sort of, you know, again, this idea that uh, the people who have these monopolies, quote unquote, are going to just restrict anybody from ever using it. No, they want to make money. They want people to use this stuff. I totally agree with you that it's important, I mean, to go back and then it's a moral issue, the, the, the respect towards the author, just ask him if it's okay to use it like that. I mean, yeah, once I, I, what for a song and the singer sang, imagine no religion, and I spent 3,000 uh, Swiss francs to find out, am I allowed to use it? And I'm, I was happy to, to have this answer because otherwise I would have ask your corner, can I use it? I mean, that's just fairness. I there see. are always some horror stories of someone who wanted to use it in some other work and then had a, you know, this enormous amount. Of, but again, those are great stories and they may occur from time to time, but I don't, that's not the norm. Uh, I thought, somebody brought it up, I thought maybe, again, Bolton might have brought it up. There's a movie that was made for $27, which won some award at Khan three years ago, and the uh, newspaper stories at the time were talking about how it only cost $27 to make the movie. Um, then went, how can you make a movie? And the answer is it was mainly home videos. And they're not including the cost of those old home videos. And they're not taking the inflated price of today. Um, so it cost him only $27 to presumably do the editing. Uh, but then he had lots of music in there to show different periods of his life. But he insisted on using the set of songs, so he wound up having to pay several hundred thousand dollars to get the clearance on like 50 songs and a bunch of new music that was composed for his movie. So it was actually wasn't that unreasonable. It was a movie that one of the board of con, people thought it had a real market value. And so that story was put out as one of these horrible examples of you know, these, these uh, terrible copyright owners overcharging for the music. And it wasn't really that unreasonable. It just sounded unreasonable if you didn't pay attention to the details. Yeah. What about the idea um, of the movement of free, of, of no copyrights? Well, there are people who want that, and for their own works, go ahead, put them in the public domain, tell anyone they can use it, I think that's fine. No one, I think, has any objection to that at all. It's just trying to force that on people who actually want to get paid. 
Okay, so you know the, the open software people, great, fine. Even though my understanding is that they use copyright to sort of keep everybody in line, yeah. so they're not against removing copyright. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm usurping your job. Two questions, and then I have to uh, uh, call to lunch. <laughs> I, I, I know that there are these problems. Um, the, I had a daughter who was into Japanese manga, and they weren't selling some that she was interested in in the US. And apparently she was saying, well, I'm not going to get the illegal ones. All right? But that's when it sort of becomes tempting. Um, those, are, those are harder cases. Um, if the seller doesn't want to make it available to you, you know, that's under normal circumstances. Um, for example, I don't know if you own a Porsche or not. Or if you could. But you'd probably like to. Most people would like to have one. All right? The fact that it's not available to you at a price you can afford doesn't mean that you could then say, well, let me walk in and give you what I have and take it. All right? And so people don't, they seem to think that they can, because this stuff is sort of available, that they should take it. But it's really, I don't know that there's any difference between them. Okay, except one's cheaper than the other. We don't like that. Terrence, yeah. I'm not really talking about the, the cost of it, I'm talking about Oh, but the, the total unavailability. But, but the Porsche's unavailable to you, too, if you don't have the money for it. Uh, just because something's not available, I mean, they could make it available if they were to go through the effort. It may not be economically viable for them to do so. And I can see under certain cases that you might want to have some changes to copyright if, if someone hasn't, their book hasn't been in print for a long time, and the author wants to make it available, is willing to finance it, maybe have the right to revert the author. I mean, there are things where nothing is necessarily completely black or white, and whoever owns the copyright now necessarily has it for all time. I'm willing to make some changes on these things, but I'd be careful about any of those. I thought I'd make a brief observation, just, just being, and I went, you don't have to reply, because we're running out of time. But I, I, always, you know, I still don't believe patents, and, and one of the reasons is that no scientist is unique. I mean, if Charles Darwin, if uh, Charles Dickens hadn't lived, no one would have written David Copperfield. That is unique to him. But if Charles Darwin hadn't lived, Wallace came up with evolution independently. All scientists are competing. And so this business of the rewards to the individual and the uniqueness of the individual product simply doesn't apply to science. Scientists are all part of a chain of knowledge. I'm talking about copyright. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm just trying to make the point there are real differences between scientists and artists. And one of them is uniqueness. Scientists are not unique. I, I, I agree. The, put a, the hundred monkeys in the room. Yeah, in science, they're going to come up with that stuff. Exactly. But they're not going to come up with, with Shakespeare. Exactly.